everyone. Welcome to today's iBio Hangout on developing scientific networks to improve education. I'm Sofia Espinosa, a graduate student at Yale University and the iBio Ambassador for Peru. We are pleased to have Dr. Daniel Colon Ramos and Dr. Giovanna Guerrero today. Before starting the handout, I'd like to give a brief introduction of Daniel and Giovanna. So, um, Daniel Colon Ramos is an associate professor at cell biology at Yale University. He got his uh, bachelor's in Harvard College and he is currently in investigating how the brain forms precise neural connections during development. Dr. Colon Ramos was born and raised in Puerto Rico and is a co-founder of Ciencia Puerto Rico. This is the web page uh, that he runs. Um, Ciencia Puerto Rico is a non-profit organization that connects Puerto Rican scientists who are spread around the globe to promote scientific research and education in Puerto Rico. Giovanna Guerrero Medina is the executive director of Ciencia PR and she is an associate research faculty at the Center for Ta Scientific Teaching at Yale University. Uh, prior to her work in Ciencia PR, um, Giovanna was Head of Science Policy at the Van Handel Research Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a Health Policy and Analyst at the National Institute of Health. Mm, Giovanna has a PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Bachelor's in Biology from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. So uh, let's start with the questions. Just for the audience, uh, I want you to remember that you can post a question on the right side of your screen. And also, if you see a question that you like, you can vote on it. We'll frequently pick one, the ones that race to the top, but we are also looking for questions that are interesting and haven't been answered yet. Uh, don't forget that you can submit your questions in English and Spanish, and also on Twitter using the hashtag iBioHangout. So, let's start. Um, we have our first question here. CSCPR seems to have been able to achieve quite a lot from what you've described in your iBioMag talk. How is it possible for a self-organized group to achieve so much? Was it easy to motivate? Uh, was I'm sorry, I, I lost it. <laughs> was it easy to motivate other scientists to participate in your initiative? Um, Daniel, uh, do you mind if I if I take it? <laughs> please, please do. Please. Um, well, yeah, so for people that don't know about Ciencia Puerto Rico that haven't seen Daniel's talk, um, we're a network that promotes uh, science education um, and outreach and mentoring through um, a community of people interested in science in Puerto Rico. For the most part, they're scientists, but we also have educators, we have students, we have members of the general public. Um, and we have implemented a number of initiatives to uh, achieve these things, to do outreach, to do mentoring. Um, for example, we have a science communications program where scientists can invite, uh, can submit articles for publication in newspapers and local in Puerto Rico um, and in, uh, internationally as well. Um, they, we've published a book uh, of science essays written by Puerto Rican science scientists for the Puerto Rican public. Um, we also promote a lot of information about scientific careers, have started a blogosphere. But in general, um, these are all initiatives that have come from the community. Um, so the, the network itself has, has been the source of all these great ideas and of all the energy to give back. Um, so although it seems like a lot, um, it really has come, you know, the, the, the ability to do all of that wouldn't be possible if we weren't a network. And I think that that was one of the, the topics we wanted to talk about today was how um, networks of scientists, communities of scientists can achieve a lot, um, particularly for their societies, their communities of, of origin, um, and you know, for, for groups that may be geographically dispersed, uh, online communities offer an opportunity to congregate and find out where areas of need are and how we can contribute. So I, I will add to that that there are essentially two concepts which are similar to the way that scientists operate in 
in other areas like like doing research, which were important in uh, getting people involved. <clears throat> One of the concepts was the fact that I mean the question says like was it easy to motivate other scientists and I feel like what we did was create resources so that motivated people could identify each other. So the motivation, much like uh, you don't motivate a scientist to do an experiment, the motivation comes from within and as a leader of a lab what I do is I create um, an environment that's conducive for that motivation and that scientist to achieve their their personal career goals and their experimental goals. Similarly, I think what we did through this network is to create tools so that scientists which were motivated were able to contribute to, to in, a, in an easy way or in an accessible way, were able to contribute to their communities of origin. So that was one concept that was very important. So um, through the network, allow people to, to express their own motivation and interest. The second one is the concept of crowdsourcing, like Giovanna mentioned. So we crowdsource knowledge. We brought these scientists together, and by collaborating with each other, for example, uh, scientific educators, which are very good at communicating with students or communicating with the general public, could create links with researchers, which are very good at creating new knowledge and at producing new knowledge, to then uh, and through collaborations be able to communicate that new knowledge that was being produced to the general public. So we created those collaborations. So so we drew a lot of lessons from how science is normally done and, and, and created tools online to to harness that energy. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, so our next question comes from Ron Vale. He asks, how do you balance running your laboratory and your, res your outreach at efforts and being successful at both, which you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So uh, I, I don't see outreach and education and research as a zero-sum game. I actually think that they are complementary, uh, mutually enhancing, synergistic activities. So I know of scientists that have had brilliant ideas and I have had great ideas myself in when I have been in in outreach efforts, for example, like when I have been, uh, I have said before that the most uh, terrifying talk that I have ever given was a talk that I gave at, at a AAAS meeting to 10-year-olds. And the reason was because I had to take my very specialized knowledge and frame it in a way that was relevant to these, to this group of kids. And that Led to led me to reflect a lot about the relevance of the knowledge I was producing, and if I was doing the most interesting experiments that I should be doing. Like uh, it turns out that what a ten-year-old kid finds really exciting is what I also find really exciting. So that helped me uh, reframe some of the research questions that we are trying to answer. So I don't, I don't see, I mean, I don't, I don't see these things as as zero-sum games. I actually think that they're synergistic. I think they're they're complementary. It does take some organization because you're doing multiple things, but if you if you can combine them in a way that they benefit each other. Yeah. What about you, Kevin? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I did start uh, as a volunteer, as most of the Ciencia Puerto Rico team is. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Ciencia Puerto Rico is an activity that I did on my time off. And, you know, I it wasn't hard to balance because I, you know, I was really committed to the idea, and I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that outside of our research and our science that we find that uh, fulfill us. Um, so, you know, if if doing outreach is something that fulfills you, I, I agree with Daniel. It's not going to be a matter of uh, you know finding time to do it. It just naturally will come. And I think another thing that I've learned through the Ciencia Puerto Rico experience and I have seen other people uh, have this realization is that uh, doing outreach can actually be very beneficial as well for you professionally. Um, you know, there's so many uh, professional lessons that I've gotten, I've, I've received from being, you know, from participating in Ciencia Puerto Rico and I've seen all my colleagues, all, all the Ciencia Puerto Rico team grow um, professionally as well in great part because of their involvement in Ciencia Puerto Rico. Like Daniel said, you know, if you if you have if you ever are challenged to explain your science to 
um, a little kid or a member of the general public, it's actually quite hard. And to develop that skill is very useful um, for scientists um, to be able to talk about their science to, to you know, all, all different types of audiences. Um, it helps you as a communicator. Um, it helps you um, as a scientist that needs to be, you know, um, uh, talk about science compellingly. Um, it's very, it's very useful to do outreach professionally. So, I would encourage anybody that has that motivation to just so, jump over yeah. the in activation energy and get it done. So, Fia, before you go to the next question, I, I would like to ask you because you're, you're a student. Like how, I mean, I, I'm bringing my perspective more as a faculty member, but how do you do it? How do you, as a graduate student, balance it? Like um, you introduced us, but you didn't introduce. <laughs> all the awesome things that you do through the through the research experience for Peruvian undergrads program that you run, uh, which is a national program that links undergrads in Peru to research experiences in the U.S. and you run it from Yale, while being a successful graduate student at Yale. So how do you do it? Okay, yeah, for for those people who who doesn't know, I'm, I'm sure it's most of you. I'm Sofia Espinosa again. I work at Tom Pollard's lab. But I also run a program that's called Research Experience for Proven Undergraduates. And what we basically do is we bring Proven Undergraduates to do um, internships here at different universities uh, in the States and in Europe, too. So, yeah, as Daniel said, I, I think we, I, I really do it because I, I believe in, in uh, there's just a lot of talent in Latin America that could be, um, that could be, uh, enhanced by bringing these students here, and I actually was part of the program myself uh, back in 2009. I came to Yale, and that helped me a lot to um, to apply to grad schools and actually enter here at Yale. So I I think it's very important, and I and I I do it because I'm passionate about it, but I also do it because there are a lot of um, uh, rewards too. I mean, I've never networked a lot with it. I've uh, been able to meet really amazing scientists and, and, and talk with them about the program. Um, I mean, I met you, Daniel, through it, actually, and, and, it, uh, and you and Giovanna, you are one of the most inspirational people uh, scientifically in my life, so it's, it's really rewarding. I think uh, if anyone is, uh, has the opportunity to do uh, science outreach, you should do it. I mean, you won't be disappointed. So that actually leads us to the next question. It's what would you recommend to young scientists who are interested in science outreach? I think, Giovanna, you have gone through this a little bit, but what about you, Daniel? Uh, there are some students that are that says, oh, I don't have enough time. You know, uh, I need to publish a paper before I think about doing these kind of things. But what, what would you recommend to those kind of people? Well, I, I, I do think that it's, um, you know, scientists in training, it's important to recognize what they're priorities are, right? And the priority is to train as a scientist because you're going to be able to, uh, if you're training as a scientist, you're going to be able to, your, your outreach efforts are going to be able to be far more effective once you have uh, developed those skills that will allow you to be a successful scientist. So I think that I just want to start with that clear priority. But again, I don't see this as a zero-sum game. I don't see this as an either-or, like I either do this or I, or I do that. Any more than I see, like, to me, some of these questions, sometimes when we make these dichotomies, they're like, they're mm -hmm. like asking, how can you work at the bench and read papers at the same time? Or how can you go to conferences and, you know, do experiments? You cannot do experiments when you're at the conference, so which one is more important? And I think they're complementary, and they enhance each other. If you're all the time at conferences and you're never at the bench, it, then that's a problem, and vice versa. So similarly, if you're doing only outreach, and you're not working on your own skills, then it's going to be hard to continue those outreach activities. But um, to get to the specific question of what would I recommend is first, recognize that you know the, the training is a very important part, uh, and then get into an outreach activity that is something that you feel passionate about, that speaks to you, that, that re-energizes you. Mm -hmm. So you might be spending some time on that outreach activity, but it's not time that is wasted, because when you come back, you come back re-energized with new ideas, with new connections, with new networks. And that is what that outreach activity is, is different for different people. But um, for example, if you're a good writer, you might want to think about maybe communicating science in 
as as a uh, in the form of like uh, science articles for newspapers or um, a blog or maybe tweet or something like that and reach different people that way. If if you are more of a speaker, you can volunteer to go to public high schools or local high schools and talk to students or participate in the science fair. It's a way of like, and it depends what what your skill sets are and what speaks to you as a, as an individual or as a scientist. Yeah, very often I think people have a little bit of an activation energy to, even if they are naturally interested in doing outreach or getting involved, um, or they might fear that people will turn them away, but in our experience, the public is really hungry for uh, interactions with scientists. I mean, just the fact that you're a scientist, that's, you know, an, that's already a, a, a remarkable thing that you can bring to the public. Um, so, you know, if, if, like Daniel said, if you're interested in writing, you might want to contact your local newspaper, um, or if you want to give talks to students, contact your, your uh, high school or the local high school, um, a church group if you're in church. You know, there's many different settings, and for the most part, people will welcome you uh, really excitedly in our experience. So don't be afraid to just reach out and, and try something. Um, more often than not, it will lead to you know a really wonderful experience, not just for the audience but for you as well. Okay, so uh, going back to the CNCPR um, theme, what were the key steps in starting CNCPR.org? This is a question from Natalia Wesolowska, and uh, I don't know, but can you comment on that, Daniel and Jovan? So how, what was the question, sorry? What were the key steps in starting CNCPR.org? And also, how would you advise scientists in other countries to go about starting the same type of organization? So I, I think one of the key steps, uh, one of the first steps was to, in the specific case of CNCPR.org, was to create a network where people could self-identify as, as interested in one topic. Uh, you can think of, like, taking it more conceptually, you can think about creating these networks in different ways. So, for example, I just participated here at UCSF in a UCSF Espanol seminar series. So that's a different type of network. It's a more local network where they invite speakers to come and give talks, science talks in, in Spanish to the community here that is interested in listening to science in Spanish. Our network was, uh, we knew that our community was more dispersed, so we created a cybernetic network. But the concept that's important is that, uh, like science, it's always more fun to do it like in a group of people because you can encourage each other, you can exchange ideas, uh, you can exchange common interest. So that was a key aspect that was very important. And then the second key aspect to me, that I thought that was important in getting Ciencia PR to work was that the people that were involved there was added value to that involvement in the organization that they were not getting from other activities. So they were able to, for example, participate in uh, outreach activities, in this case in Puerto Rico or among Hispanic communities. Uh, they were able to go and give talks at the university there. They were able to talk to students. They were, we could help them get their articles published in newspapers in Puerto Rico or podcasts. So they were, they were getting something extra uh, for their efforts that they w normally wouldn't get, and that kept people motivated. And I think that that's another important aspect, that when these groups get started, uh, they, it, I would recommend, b based on the experiences that we had, that they don't, you know, you can, you can set up very lofty goals, but like Giovanna said, you need an activation energy, and it's better to start with, like, like in science, you can have a very conceptually, a very big, important, broad question, but one of the skills that you learned as a scientist is to then take that question and break it down into achievable goals. So it's important to recognize achievable goals that are, will keep you motivated and will add value to your life and go after those too. Yeah, and, and for, from a more practical standpoint, um, you know, if you're interested in, in starting a network, um, I think, you know, first of all, like Daniel said, it has, you have to have a real need from from the audience itself and a participation like without that that that's definitely key all the things that Ciencia Puerto Rico has done have have been because 
a member or a volunteer said, you know, there's this problem in Puerto Rico where textbooks don't represent, you know, don't talk about science with examples from Puerto Rican life. How can we change that? And so an initiative grew out of that. Um, so members being the source of ideas is very important. I, I think another key aspect for most social networks is to be able to give content that the audience appreciates. So that's why at Ciencia Puerto Rico we do a lot of content curating. Um, we're constantly putting up information about scientific events that are of interest to our members, uh, scientific news, uh, information about fellowships, about research training. Um, we do this actively. Members of the community also contributed. And I think in this way, Ciencia Puerto Rico is very dynamic, very active, um, and has information that you know, our members, our audience actually uh, find useful and appreciate. Um, and then uh, I put in the in the iBio event page a link to the article that we published recently about uh, Ciencia Puerto Rico, what we've done. Um, it also has a section on kind of things that we've learned through the experience of uh, building Ciencia Puerto Rico. Um, so I think, you know, I, I would advise people to go read that paper. Um, there's some, some tidbits there that, that you can find to, if you're interested in starting something similar. I, I, I will also add one, one final thought, like going to, to uh, Karen's, Karen Dell's question specifically of how will we advise scientists in other countries to go about starting the same type of organization. I will mention that because we have gone through the experience and the lab work of setting up a lot of the tools that will be useful for this type of organizations, I will advise them to start by contacting us. We, everything that we created is open source and was created with the purpose of sharing. So if, if there are people interested in creating these types of, of organizations elsewhere, they can, and some, some countries have already contacted us, they can contact us and, and we will be happy to either guide or share the resources that we have created that will facilitate the establishment, the establishment of that organization. Now the resources that we will be sharing, we'll be sharing some knowledge, and we'll also be sharing some op open source code, but the most important resource is going to, are going to be the scientists from the place that wants to establish this. So yeah. I do believe strongly that this needs to be a grassroots effort emerging from the place that where, where this needs to be, would like to be established. Oh, and I, f I remember one more thing that I wanted to add. <laughs> um, another, another kind of lesson learned is that um, having strong connections with the leadership of uh, scientific institutions if, at, you know, from the community that you want to um, nurture or get involved um, is very useful for us. You know, we have contacts mostly also through our members, through the volunteers, with uh, the leaders of uh, most of the universities and colleges in Puerto Rico. And like Daniel said, we go and give talks at these colleges and universities. And those contacts have been very useful, both in terms of uh, disseminating some of the initiatives that that we promote, and also in terms of um, uh, of you know making the community um, uh, visible to a lot more uh, greater number of people um, who can then tell us what you know what the needs are so that's another little tidbit that we found <laughs> great um, so this is actually a personal question Daniel how did everything start why did you decide to create TNCFER in the first place so I, I, when I was a graduate student at Duke University, I, um, well, first, before I was a graduate student at Duke University, when I was an undergrad and I was deciding what I was going to do with my life, I was lucky enough to meet a mentor at a very key step of my career that helped me um, elucidate some things about what I wanted my career to be like. and. Uh, he, he, you know, mentors can be from any walk of life and ethnicity and everything, but this person bo was both a mentor and a role model because he was also a fellow Puerto Rican researcher. So it helped me both in terms of the mentorship, but also in terms of uh, me picturing how, how I could be a researcher uh, and how I could contribute to Puerto Rico being a researcher. And that was, that was key for me. So later, when I was in grad school, I wanted to reconnect and um, the experience of 
we connect with Puerto Rico, and the experience of me meeting this mentor was very accidental. So I was thinking, what if, what if all of these events had not happened? I would have never met this person, and maybe I would not be a scientist today, although I love doing science. So I was thinking, is there a way in which you know we could create communities that that will um, make this more likely to happen, that not not as accidental? And I started thinking about cost-effective ways of achieving that, of reaching out, of giving back. And I thought about the internet. I mean, the internet was it was that time it was around the late '90s, so. You know, these social networking sites were starting, and I was thinking this, this could be a great tool for scientists to connect and to exchange ideas. Uh, but I didn't implement it until I became a postdoc, in part because, I mean, I did some outreach things. Like, I went to Puerto Rico and gave some talks. But the Ciencia PR initiative, per se, I didn't implement until I became a postdoc, in part because I was, as I was mentioning before, focusing on my training. And then as a postdoc, I felt like I had a little bit more knowledge to be able to, to implement this particular outreach initiative. And I did that with the help of an undergrad at Stanford. And that's, you know, actually, it, not a lot of people know, but Ciencia Puerto Rico uh, originally was a string database for C. elegans. So this was created by an undergrad. There was an undergrad at Stanford in the lab that I was working at that created this database so that we could find the C. elegans strains that we were freezing. And I, you know, I guess my mind was prepared to see the value of that as a possible database for scientists. So I said, look, instead of the position of the, in the freezer, it could be where this person is in the world, and instead of the strain information, it could be the scientific interest of the person. And that's how Ciencia Puerto Rico started. It was actually a, a strain database modified. And now it's not that. Now it has many more resources. But it, that, that's what I meant by breaking it down in achievable goals. That's, that was the very first iteration of Ciencia PR. Okay. So, Giovanna, you joined Ciencia PR a, a little bit afterwards. Uh, why, why did you join the, uh, the community? Why, why did you like it, about it the most? Ah, for me, I don't know. It was like revolutionary. I almost remember that I was working late. Um, I was doing actually a, an internship at the National Academies, and I, you know, found this link by accident. I think I don't even know what I was Googling. And uh, for me, it was like amazing. Like, there's actually a community for people from Puerto Rico uh, that are scientists. This, this is awesome. So I joined. Uh, I lurked around for a few months, um, and then eventually I decided to contact Daniel and say, "Hey, I think this is great what you're doing, and I, I would like to help out in any way I can. You know, I'm interested in science policy. Maybe I can help out with that." So um, that's. That's how it got started. Um, yeah, it, it was just, you know, a really great thing that some, like a gift somebody had put, put out there. <laughs> <laughs> great. So uh, let's change the topic a little bit. I don't know if you have heard about uh, what Ecuador is doing right now with Jachai. So our, our next question says, um, are you familiar with the Ecuadorian project to build and develop a whole city dedicated uh, to research and development and education called Jachai? What would you think it is the biggest challenge they may face along that journey? Um, capacity development in countries um, where science and technology is still not, you know, a very established sector is, is really complex. In Puerto Rico, we have some of the same challenges, I think. Um, you know, we still, uh, we, we want to make Puerto Rico a place where uh, knowledge is appreciated, it's translated, it uh, leads to social, economical outputs, um, it can help, help society grow. And we're, we're making strides, um, but in terms of challenges, you know, you, you have to, number one, recognize that science is important um, and has to be integrated into education. Um, you know, there has to be kind of a bottom-up uh, recognition of the importance of science. And then at the same time, I think top-down initiatives are also very important. You know, you have to um, look for ways to incentivize the training of uh, scientists. You need to look for ways to incentivize uh, that people come back from, you know, a, a lot of us leave, have to leave um, uh, for training uh, in Puerto Rico as well. So you have this, these diasporas of scientists. You have to incentivize those people in some way to give back 
uh, to your to your country. Um, they could either you could either try to get them to come back physically, um, but at Ciencia Puerto Rico, I think we you know we found that what they can contribute from uh, overseas is still very very useful. Um, you know you can still have research collaborations that impact your home country um, without necessarily having to you know uh, move back. You can still have partnerships um, where there's exchange of information where you're providing. Uh, you know, research services to other countries, whether other countries are, you know, exchanging information with you. Um, but, you know, again, so I think a top-down needs to happen uh, to have, you know, incentives and resources put in place, but bottom-up also needs to be there in order for these research and development initiatives to be sustainable. So, so I, I'm familiar with the initiative of Ecuador of Yashai. I haven't visited the site, but I'm familiar with it. And, and I, I think it's fantastic that there are places uh, like, like countries like Ecuador that are prioritizing uh, research. And I think it's, it's fantastic. It's historic. And you know, this, this initiative that, that Sofia you have with Peru is another example of a, of a community of scientists in in Latin America, also prioritizing research and education, which is also great. I've, I've heard that there are initiatives also in Brazil, and I think so. One of there, there are a few challenges that I that I foresee that that um, that are important to recognize, but they shouldn't be deterrents because I think the, the first recognition should be that scientific the science is a humanistic enterprise that belongs to all of us. So when a scientist makes a discovery, humanity benefits. And I, I think that we, we all participate either as discoverers, which is hopefully what, what these countries are looking to do too, or as consumers of that knowledge. And I think it's, you know, it's something that impacts everybody. So I think it's great that some of these countries that haven't participated in the dialogue are now participating in the dialogue or looking to participate. So that's, that's excellent. The challenge will come from the fact that, that um, we have to recognize that the, the, the infrastructure is one necessary step for creating science, but it's not sufficient. So you have infrastructure at two levels. One of them is the physical infrastructure, like, my, like equipment or buildings. And the other one is the, the, what Giovanna was referring to by education, which is the personal infrastructure, the scientists. And it's the scientists that ultimately do the experiments. And when you're starting, you you run into the problem that the first scientists that are going to be pioneering uh, that city are going to be a little bit maybe isolated from the international scientific community while that community is, is getting some traction and starting. And I, that's where I think that initiatives like Ciencia PR are perhaps very innovative and, and are, you know, the internet is a game changer because um, no longer do we need to be isolated because of our geographical dispersion. We can exchange information, we can contribute like there are scientists from different parts of the world that can that can connect and and regardless of where they are physically, they can still have contributions to other places through these through these social networking sites. So that is something that probably can benefit the development of of science initiatives like Yashai, but but it, they're not it's not gonna be the only thing that's gonna benefit it, but it is something that might facilitate it. And uh, recognizing that also uh, how science works. Like I think uh, there's a lot of emphasis on, on applied sciences, which are very important, uh, translational science, which is also very important, but it's also fundamental to recognize that the driver, the engine behind scientific discoveries is basic research. It's our, the knowledge that we produce from fundamental processes uh, in the different disciplines, like from material sciences to basic biology, is what leads to revolutionary discoveries that, that, that then drive the applied sciences. So the countries that are looking to implement these processes, it, it's important also for them to recognize that these are very important investments, investments that are going to pay off. Historically, they have paid off for other places, but they're long-term investments. So they cannot just be fads that, you know, investments that take a few years and then they fall off the face of the earth. Great. So um, there's this uh, other question. In your talk, Making Science Relevant, you discuss the relevance of context for learning. Do you think that scientists around the world are doing a better job making science more relevant now than when you were growing up? Um, 
I'm not. I, so, do I think it, they're making a better job now than when I was uh, growing up? I think the regions in the world where science is uh, very well contextualized, and uh, those places stand as beacons of of how science should be taught, and with their limitations. And I mean, like a good example is, uh, of course, the U.S. Like I think the science is very. If you were born and raised here in the U.S., you will find. Um, science programming and examples of natural processes that are exemplifying important scientific concepts that are that, that will talk to you. Um, I don't think that's the reality for most of the world. And I don't think that has changed in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it's something that will change as we recognize that uh, contextualizing science to the person's uh, reality, and that those realities are going to change. So this is not an easy task, but but that is but it's an essential task to be able to reach out to the to the public and uh, the general public, the world public, and explain to them how science is impactful in their context. And this is particularly important when science is really changing our daily lives, from from the development of new technology to the development of new medicine. So. It's what's something that you can consider scientific literacy. And if people are not scientifically literate, regardless of where they are, like uh, in the US or other places, then, then that is, uh, that's going to be a big problem for society. Yeah, I, I want to mention I went to Puerto Rico recently and I looked at the books that were being offered by the, uh, to the public schools. And I found one that on the cover it had a zebra. <laughs> In Puerto Rico, there's no zebras. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's still a lot that we can do to help, um, you know, show kids that science is not something that they just get through a textbook, that science is really all around them. And, um, you know, through your sense of curiosity, you can, you can start doing science. You can start doing science with the things you have around you. You know, and I think that's, that's one of the keys of why contextualization is important, why we call making science contextual, making science relevant, um, is that idea that, um, you know, the student can be a scientist. That's a very powerful idea. And I don't think we're communicating it very well right now, uh, probably anywhere. So how is Ciencia PR then helping contextualizing science in Puerto Rico? That's something we, we are very consciously doing and have been consciously doing for, for some time now. I think, number one, uh, first of all, just having our network uh, member profiles be open uh, access is very important because right there you're giving the world, uh, you know, thousands of uh, this is what a scientist looks like, right? Um, we all know that website and love it. Um, well, Ciencia Puerto Rico also, you know, has thousands of this is what a scientist looks, looks like. And, and that information already, I think, is very important to showing kids uh, that scientists come from communities just like theirs. They come from their own neighborhoods. They, they come from the, their same high schools. They can aspire to be scientists. Um, another thing that, that we do when we... Um, get submissions for articles is we try to help the, the writer think about how that they can present science through examples from Puerto Rican culture, from the landscape, um, how to make science, uh, place it in, in the context of the student. Um, that's also that something that we want, that we stress. Um, and right now, one of the things we want to do is, you know, we've had over 400 submissions of articles over the past eight years. Uh, we want to try to make all that content more accessible to uh, teachers. Um, so one of the things we're going to be trying to do in the next few years is um, help teachers understand how they can apply all this content that the members have produced, uh, the, the members' profiles themselves in the classroom uh, to send those messages to the students that they can aspire to be scientists, that science is done in Puerto Rico, that science has a relevance to their daily lives. Um, do you have anything to add, Daniel, to that question? I, I will just add that, um, you know, contextualizing science is uh, particular, it's hard for everybody, but it's particularly hard for non-scientists. So, 
it's, mm -hmm. it comes easier to scientists. So, for example, when we have, by having a network of thousands of scientists, one of the things that we were able to do was just to ask our scientists, can you contextualize what you're doing to Puerto Rico? Can you explain why, as a Puerto Rican, you're interested in what you're doing and how that will be relevant to, you know, your aunt or your grandmother or somebody like a Puerto Rican that's not a scientist? And or your, your grandfather, your father. Like, so the... The idea with that was to, to um, allow the scientists that were in the network to uh, reach out and provide um, experiences that linked their knowledge as scientists with their experiences for many of them growing up in, in Puerto Rico. And um, that is something that, I, that would have been incredibly hard to do if you didn't have a network of scientists. And I've seen educators wrestle with that. Like, I think the reason these books do not exist in other places is because they don't have these networks to create the content. Like, how do you approach it? Like, one of the essays that we got, for example, was from a geologist talking about how Puerto Rico, they called Puerto Rico was born in the Pacific, and they talk about this area of Puerto Rico that they have done these geological studies and shown that it, w it started in the Pacific. That's knowledge that I'm a scientist, but I'm not a geologist, so I didn't have. So I can contextualize other aspects of biology, but not that aspect. So uh, my point is that scientists have a lot of power in, in, in education, in, in bringing examples, in bringing their different experiences, life experiences to bear, integrating it with their knowledge, and, and reframing it in a way that impacts the education system in their communities of origin. Great. So uh, our next question is from iBiology. Ciencia Puerto Rico has been successful in creating a social network site for scientists from Puerto Rico. Are things like this opening in other countries? Have you seen other communities follow your example? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would say they have followed our example, but I have seen some really awesome uh, communities also start up. Uh, one of the ones that I, I think, you know, I personally think is very dynamic and I really like a lot is Red Ciencia, which is from Chile. Uh, they're also doing some some very interesting things, um, but there could there could be so many more, um, and I don't know why they you know they haven't started up. Um, you know, I, I I don't know, Daniel. Do you have any that you want to point out? I don't think there are too many, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, Red Ciencia is a good example of another successful network, and I think it 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 emerged around the same time as Ciencia Puerto Rico. So I don't think. Uh, I think we ad mutually admire each other's work, but I don't think they are following our example um, particularly. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, I do believe that that um, there is uh, that that other. I mean, these networks are clearly successful. So I think that other communities could follow the example uh, to the benefit of those communities. We have we've had conversations with. We're in conversations right now with uh, the Ministry of Science in Ecuador to try to implement something similar for Ecuador. We've been talking to you, Sofia, about doing something for Peru. The AAAS approached us about doing something for Haiti, recognizing that most scientists that would like to contribute to Haiti, regardless of if they're Haitian or not, are, but, but even the 40 Haitian ones, many of them are not in Haiti. So if you want to contribute to that knowledge, how do you bring them together? And these uh, social platforms are a very cost-effective way of, of bringing these scientists together to contribute to these communities. So um, actually, that leads us to another question from Alexandra Escobar, but also from me. Uh, what are the key features that you have identified in Ciencia Puerto Rico to keep your network alive? Is it just reaching the critical mass, or, or what else do you need? Well, like I mentioned, I think giving the the members content that can be useful to them is very, very important. You know, I, I think um, that's something that keeps Ciencia Puerto Rico very active. Um, one of the topics we've also been discussing is, you know, lis listening to the members and giving them an opportunity to bring their own projects and ideas to the table. Um, I mean, that, that basically has been Ciencia Puerto Rico for the last eight years. Um, everything has evolved organically thanks to the, the people's energy and creativity. Um, I don't know, Daniel, do you have any other uh, other ideas? I mentioned, you know, engaging the leadership of institutions back home, um, 
yeah, taking advantage of if anybody that wants to contribute uh, is welcome at Ciencia Puerto Rico, and I think that that has been very helpful to us. It is. It, I mean, it is a community. So, uh, the in order for people to belong to a community, they have to find some sort of. There has to be some value in that community for them, and mm -hmm. we. I think the way we have kept it alive is by give, all the tools that we have created. They all share the common fact or the, the common aspiration, at least, to be able to facilitate uh, the ideas of the community. So, you know, we try to create uh, profiles so that the community can put in information about their research. We try to create blog sections so that the community can write about their experiences. Mm -hmm. We try to create initiatives with newspapers so that the community can contribute and impact education. And we also have the channels of communication very open with the community so that we can receive ideas and respond to the ideas of the community. And it's very user-driven, so it's not... It's not they're coming with their ideas. Sometimes they do. Sometimes people come with their ideas and tell us, wouldn't it be great if we did this? And those ideas, they, they're not the ideas that end up happening. The ideas that end up happening are the ideas from like, it's similar to science. It's an individual that says, I would like to do this. Can you help me? And, um, and then we create tools because we think if there's one person that would like to do that, there are probably more people. And they drive that initiative. And because they become the drivers of that initiative, the initiative, the initiative works. So it's very uh, driven by the individuals within the community, and we're more conduits to that energy. Yeah, and I think also being very open to anybody that, that wants to contribute, whether, you know, when you sign up for Ciencia Puerto Rico, uh, you don't have to, there's no criteria for membership. Uh, you can, you know, you, you self-select. Uh, basically, as somebody that is interested in the topics that we talk about, um, so that you know that has led to interactions with educators, with uh, you know members from the public that want to um, get in, involved in the interface of science and art. Uh, I think there's a question in the on the side uh, about that. Um, so. You know, they can be people from Puerto Rico, they can be people from other places that work in Puerto Rico or that are aside and have collaborations with Puerto Rico. Like I said, anybody is welcome. Um, and that has also led to a lot of uh, interesting collaborations, partnerships, ideas, uh, interactions. Great. So um, there's another question from iBiology. So I think, Danielle, you mentioned in your iBiomag talk that you were one of the first people in your community to become a scientist. Do you think this makes you more aware of our responsibility as scientists to bring science understanding to non-scientists? Um, I, I mean, I, I can only speak about my own experience. I did, it did make me, I, I was very aware about um, my, um, Interest. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, yes, responsibility in my case too. But but um, at, at the very least, interest in in linking my knowledge to to the people from my community. And the reason for that is because I I think I said this before. I think that scientific literacy is to the 21st century what knowing how to read and write was to the 20th century. And it's a concept that Carl Sagan had mentioned, also mentioned in the 80s. Like there's some videos of him talking about how how important it is to have a community of people that are literate in science, because there's so many decisions that need to be made at all levels that depend on scientific knowledge, like for, from global warming to economic decisions. And so I I felt that as uh, my knowledge and my training in science grew, I wanted to uh, explain to my community why why that knowledge was important, how it was universal. Like I think there was a misconception that that knowledge resided somewhere else. It was a knowledge that you tapped into when you needed it, but it was a knowledge that that didn't have to do with with Puerto Rico or my community. And and I wanted to eliminate that that myth because that's not that's not true. I mean, science is a is a very humanistic. Um, a thing. It's uh, and 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 it belongs to everybody, and it benefits everybody. That knowledge benefits everybody. Yeah. 
So, um, Giovanna, how, from all these years of experience at Ciencia Puerto Rico, how do you think it's the best way um, to motivate scientists and PhD students to enter and participate in the network? This question comes from James Sum, and he's talking about a particular case of Ecuador, but I, I would go a little bit uh, broader and say to any scientific network, how do you motivate and encourage people to participate? Um, I mean, I think we, uh, a lot of them are self-motivated, like I said. Um, we don't necessarily go out and actively, you know, tell people contribute or, or do something. Um, we, we let them self-identify. Um, but I think the work also, the work that we do also energizes people. Um, you know, I think when you start hearing a buzz about science from other people, that motivates you um, as a scientist to continue doing what you're doing and to maybe, you know, get more involved in, in, in outreach. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if we actively motivate them, but I think through our experience, uh, uh, through our example, um, we've recruited a lot of people that maybe wouldn't have uh, gotten involved to get involved. Um, yeah. yeah I, I think we're talking about cohorts of people that are highly motivated to begin with. So what they need are conduits to be able to take that energy and, and do what they love. And... Um, that, for some of them, includes sharing their knowledge. It includes reconnecting to their communities of origin. So they're not communities. It's a little counterintuitive, but actually, we haven't found motivation to be an issue at all. Um, yeah. It has uh, an issue, a uh, more present issue for us is uh, how can we make enough resources to be able to address all the, all the interest and all the needs and all the energy uh, from our community. That's a, that's a more realistic problem that we're dealing with. Yeah, right now we have over 50 uh, people that have submitted requests to be volunteers on Ciencia PR, but we don't have the number of people to be able to manage such a large volunteer program, so that's, that's an example. And that, like Daniel said, I think giving people examples of how they can contribute, uh, covering different bases for, you know, different avenues of, of um, ways in, that, in which people can contribute, that that will help, you know, quite a bit. You know, if, if you can show the example of a graduate student that wrote a paper and that got published in, in the newspaper, um, or show the example of a person that, a scientist that visited a school, um, that, that, I think those examples can lower the activation energy for a lot of people and get them motivated to contribute. Great. Um, so, our next question comes from Karen Dell. In the U.S., there are challenges to being a minority scientist. Does Ciencia Puerto Rico help promote examples of Hispanic scientists in the U.S.? As scientists from Puerto Rico, do you think you are role models for scientists from other Latin American countries? Uh, Yes, I mean, I think that's that's one of the the things that uh, where we found to be doing to be serving a role and a need um, like I said you know when I, I found out about Ciencia Puerto Rico I got really excited at that time you know I had been a grad student in the US and I had been missing some connection to Puerto Rico for a while um, you know I had been feeling a little bit isolated from my community which is I think a feeling that a lot of minority underrepresented students in science experience and this was a way for me to connect with other people that have, you know, with whom I shared a background, a culture, a language. Um, so the network itself, I think, helps a lot of other students that, um, like me, come to the U.S. for training, find themselves uh, being underrepresented in science. Um, the, the network provides that, that sense of community that, that a lot of them are missing. It provides uh, also professional networks um, that, you know, perhaps are more, they can access more easily. Um, and those are all issues that underrepresented minorities face that I think uh, networks can help uh, mitigate. Um, are we role models for scientists from other Latin American countries? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and I think we also get a lot of 
uh, fulfillment from seeing scientists from other Latin American countries succeed and uh, uh, yeah I, I think you know we we can be all role models for for each other I, I, I heard somebody one of these meetings that I was participating mentioned that the US was an honorary Latin American country because there's so many Hispanics here now particularly with the changing demographics and I I mean, I mentioned, that, I mentioned that because it made me think about how, in reality, this is just kind of a continuum. You know, like, um, I, I mean, they're role models from, like, a successful scientist is a role model for any aspiring scientist. And I, you know, I heard about, I'm sitting here right now in Bruce Albert's office in California, and uh, when he, I remember, like, I, I had friends that, that coordinated the visit that he made to Chile, and they were talking about how inspiring the students in Chile were to have Bruce Alberts there. So, you know, in that in that sense, like we are all role models for each other. And in, in terms of Latin Americans and Hispanics, that is, you have the aspect of role models, and then you have, you know, the the, the fact that you can really uh, visualize yourself in, the, in that other person. And I think that exists without any boundaries. I, if, particularly for, for Hispanic scientists or for Latin American scientists, I think that's one big continuum going from Canada all the way to Patagonia, like I, you know, if, if you see a Hispanic Latino scientist being successful, I, you definitely empathize with that and, and that, that resonates. Uh, it's true for any scientist, but, but, but in terms of that particular cohort, it's true for, for any scientist regardless of where they were born in, in those countries, that's what I think. So there's this uh, question uh, that is very interesting, is there anything the United States or other countries could learn from how Puerto Rico educates its students scientists. Are there any critical cultural historical aspects that maybe make Puerto Rican education better or worse? Hmm. Ah, I don't know. That's a hard one to answer cuz I I don't know how other people how other countries educate, you know, what their educational systems are like. I mean, I think uh, there's definitely things in the educational system in Puerto Rico that can be improved and that's where we have been focusing our efforts. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, the textbooks are still not textbooks that are produced in Puerto Rico. They very often don't include any examples of science that is being done in Puerto Rico. That's something I would like to see changed. They often, there's no mention of any Puerto Rican scientists. That's something that I would like to see changed. Um, you know, if you look at things like uh, standardized testing measures, there's, you know, definitely things we could improve uh, in the education in, in Puerto Rico. But what I would say is that there, uh, for the local scientific community um, and for the diaspora, as we've learned through our initiative with Ciencia PR, there is a lot of interest for scientists to get involved. So I see a lot of activity from universities in Puerto Rico. Uh, of doing outreach, of doing K through 12 outreach, um, and I don't know if that replicates in other Latin American countries or in other countries in general. Um, but that's something that I see as a very unique, uh, a positive, uh, at least in in the education in Puerto Rico. I, I mean, I think uh, certainly in the U.S. they have there are more resources for if you you were born here, as I was mentioning there. You know, I see like Discovery Channel, and um, there, there are just more programs, but there are also challenges. I mean, I think again because I'm in the office of Bruce Alberts, I think about about the work that he has done to try to to change the um, education in the U.S., which, which, you know, we have lived through a. Um, a biological sciences revolution in the last 60 years that. That saw everything from the discovery of the structure of DNA to the sequencing of the human genome in a in a span of 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 like one human lifespan, you know. So it's it was very fast, and I don't think our education system has caught up with that. Yeah, and I'm sitting right now at the Yale Center. Oh. Yeah. The Yale Center for Scientific Teaching. Uh, so I should uh, make a plug for um, the work that they do in trying to also. Uh, change uh, education here in the U.S., in particular undergraduate education, you know, I think there's still a lot that can be do, done in this country as well to improve 
science education to make it more uh, inquiry based, to make it more uh, a conversation with the students rather than lectures, um, to look for ways, you know, to to actively be looking where science, where students are not understanding certain scientific concepts, and then focusing on on that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's the education is a topic that's of concern for all countries, and that you know where, where we can improve a great deal in the next. Uh, Few years. I think there's. I mean, there's an internalist. Another thing to to, to, to recognize, and I mean, we're here in I, I biology, so that's a it's a perfect example. It's the internationalization of of these efforts in that you know work because of tools like the internet, uh, efforts that are being done here at UCSF. You can broadcast them uh, worldwide, and then you have people like I know that there's some schools in Peru, for example, that use the iBiology seminar series as part of their curriculum. So that, you know, all of a sudden, there are people that have access to the scientists and their knowledge and their stories uh, beyond just the publications and the papers, which is something that they could have had access to before. Now they have access to these, the, the background of how they achieved uh, those discoveries. And, um, and that can be shared widely. So, so there are programs that are impacting education uh, internationally. Great. So, time's up. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with uh, our audience today? Um, well, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of very interesting questions on the sidebar. I think it'd be great if people want to continue the conversation on the iBio uh, page. Um, I'd be, I'm going to stay around and be happy to, you know, chat and answer questions there um, after the talk. Great. I will, I will only say that I think, I mean, these are for, for training scientists and for established scientists, these are very exciting times in, in, in science um, networking, using uh, cybernetic tools and impacting communities that were very hard to reach uh, before and creating links. I, I would, I, I'll finish with a final thought, which I've been reading this book that was that was written in the 90s about the history of molecular biology. It's called The Eighth Day of Creation, written by Judson. And um, there are a few pages talking about Sidney Brenner, who's the Nobel laureate person that worked with Francis Crick on the elucidation of the genetic code, but also who was the person that established C. elegans as a model organism. And there are a few pages where he's discussing how isolated he felt when he was working as a scientist in South Africa. He was originally from South Africa. And I feel like one of the things that comes across in the book is the importance of scientists uh, cross-pollinating, cross-pollinating ideas, cross-pollinating uh, in terms of both uh, research discoveries, but also in terms of education and other initiatives. And I, I think that what we're witnessing is probably the beginning of a new way of scientists cross-pollinating um, across using these cybernetic platforms across different countries and helping each other as you know, helping integrate other communities that are not necessarily uh, participating in the international dialogue of science, like helping them bring them on board. And I think that that is very exciting. And at Ciencia PR, I mean, it's an initiative that started with a focus in Puerto Rico, but we're very much interested in helping anybody that wants to get that dialogue starting in their communities of origin. We're very interested in helping them establish that. Yeah, it would be really nice to see the idea going to other countries. I'm sorry, Giovanna, do you have a... Well, if anybody wants more information or wants to contact me or Daniel, um, they can just email uh, contact at cienciapr.org, and that's uh, C-I-E-N-C-I-A-P-R.org, contact at C-I-E-N-C-I-A-P-R.org. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for uh, everything you have done and, and are doing for Latin American science. Um, you are role models for people like me that we're, you know, entering into science and we look forward for your work and thanks for this amazing hangout session. And if you haven't watched Danielle's iBio Talks, you should do it. You're not going to uh, regret that they are really amazing. He also has a really nice TED Talk. and. 
remember that we post all of these videos online, so you can rewatch this session. And stay tuned on Facebook and Twitter for more information about the next Q&A session from iBiology. Thank you again. Thank Thanks, you. Sophia. Bye.